Welcome to the last talk for today. And um, this talk is not intended to actually bash JavaScript. That's not what I'm here for. But we want to have a good laugh. So don't take this talk too serious. You're going to learn a couple of things about JavaScript, but it's not actually there to actually educate you. Because I'm thinking probably all of you guys, you're filled up with information. You maxed out for the day. So we at least should have a good laugh and end the day on a good note. Um, I think at this time of the day, I don't need to introduce myself, but maybe there's like one person who just came in. Um, my name is Daniel. I work for Google on the Wit team, and I like to do mobile stuff. I'm going to be briefly touching on the history of JavaScript and why things are how they are. And then I'm going to dwell on the quirks of JavaScript and what's basically wrong with JavaScript. But we're also going to talk about that JavaScript is actually serving two masters. How Brennan Eich puts it. People writing it by hand and an increasing number of people compiling to it. And hopefully we have some good laughs as well. And this is not about bashing a certain language. You will never hear from Google something like Java is better than JavaScript. Because it's all about what you feel comfortable with. If you're a JavaScript ninja and you're really good at this, you should be probably writing in JavaScript. And we have lots of people at Google that do this. But we have also people that feel comfortable with Java. And then they're just writing Java code. So there's no, this language is better than the other. And we're not going to tell you here that JavaScript is not a language that is really good. Because look at it. JavaScript is really successful. It's the most successful language we actually got. And you should definitely take it serious. And therefore, you should actually learn JavaScript. You're web developers. And you should know as much JavaScript to be able to dig yourself out of a hole. So learn about the good stuff in JavaScript. Also learn about the bad stuff, and then know how to keep away from this. Just as a side note, in general, functional programming tends to be a lot of fun, especially if you come from a typely, a typely, from a type language like Java. So let's actually get into it. So there's the history of JavaScript, and this stuff actually started out as Brandon, the actual founder of this language, likes to call it as his 10 days in May. So he basically said something like, it started out in a really, really big hurry, as a prototype, actually. And he says, the, the history is actually well known when it comes to JavaScript. <coughs> but nobody wants to take the full credit for it. Everybody just wants to give him the blame. <laughs> So he had this 10 days to make a prototype at Netscape. But he wasn't aware that this was actually becoming a shipping prototype. And as soon as he actually discovered this, he actually went back and said, well, I need to change a couple of things about this. You, know, you can't be serious about this. But at this point, this was already shipping. And he couldn't do anything about that. And that was known as LiveScript. That's what JavaScript was about to become. So, and then, well, Netscape shaped Netscape 2, and Microsoft started cloning it with IE2. They put the same language in there because at this point, Netscape was the dominating browser on the web, and they figured they needed to have the same set of features to actually compete. He actually got an email from someone at Microsoft that told him, that was a very bright guy, they told him, yeah, we should probably standardize on this language. There's a couple of things in there, like the double equals operator, we should probably fix because people cannot seriously program with this. And at this point, he actually tried to be ready for this at Netscape, but no one at Netscape wanted to actually do it because kind of standardization is giving up that advantage you had. Um, at a later point where they didn't have that anymore, he actually reached out to Microsoft and uh, to the same guy and told him, well, we should probably now standardize. I can actually get my people on board. But then the Microsoft product manager said, well, no, <laughs> we're not going to do this. So for a long time, basically, it looked like JavaScript is caught up in that. And the only thing you could probably do is like a couple of lines that did form validation. So in 1999, they actually sat down and established a modern baseline called ExmaScript 3. And that's basically what you guys are using today, let's say, in the older browsers. But in 2005, people actually discovered that there's a solid core to JavaScript, that there's actually value in this language. Brandon did not just come up with a really crazy language. He actually made a really good job. If I would have to come up with a language in 10 days, you would all hate me so much if you had to use it. But Brent made a really good job. He can decently program in JavaScript. 
And that founded the whole Ajax revolution. That also founded Quiz because now there was suddenly a runtime where people would actually write decent programs like Google Maps that people would have only imagined to write with Flash or Silverlight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't joke about it. Ray pointed that out in one of his keynotes. He said there were actual conferences going on. You can still research the papers where people said the future of the web is Flash and Silverlight. And that sounds stupid today. It sounds so stupid because it hasn't been. So in 2008, they tried ECMAScript 4, which we all know was a great success, but it wasn't. And in 2009, actually, there was ECMAScript 5, which we used straight. And some of this, like object.create or the JSON stuff, is actually now live in Chrome and Firefox. It's there, and I think naive as well. So in 2012, ECMAScript is uh, finally on the way. It has lots of important stuff like modules, proxies, and so on and so forth. It actually makes things better for people writing by hand but it also makes things better for people compiling to JavaScript. Actually, JavaScript has the power to actually get better over time. Really slowly, but it's getting better. But it still has these quirks. Like stuff that just breaks. And if you don't know about this, you're going to end up in such a weird state. <laughs> so, and let's get actually into one thing that it does particularly bad, and that's the double equals operator. So I'm thinking you should be learning at least something from the talk, so I put down the rules for the double equals operator. We can go now over them one by one. <laughs> well, it, it doesn't make sense. Let me actually demo you, you why it doesn't make sense. So let me quickly switch projectors here. Yeah, that looks good. Let's take this, but let's make it a little bit bigger. Is that good to read? I guess so. We can make it a little bit bigger. No, maybe a little bit smaller. So, let's see. So, you perhaps know there's an equals operator in JavaScript that actually allows you to compare different types. So what is a string of two compared to the number two? Is that true or false? Hands up. Is that true? So pretty cool feature, I would guess, like comparing stuff across types without any work. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> so there's actually a notion of having a triple equals in JavaScript. Anybody want to have a guess what this does? Okay, just it does false because the types are not different. It actually checks for the types first and then, well. But why would I use triple equals? That's like more code size. And if it just, if the double operator just does stuff for me, that doesn't really make sense, or does it? So let's have a couple of guesses here. What's this? Array equals array. Oh, you can't really see them well, I'm sorry. Let me move that a little. Ah, this is much better. Oh, just a second. Okay, so what this is this going to be? So I would actually be fine with true or false because it can have the notion of Java objects where those are two distant objects, so they're not equal. They're like different memory addresses. Or it could be true if Java 2 said, I'm just going to look into if this has the same values, it's going to be true. Let's see which route JavaScript goes. Okay, it's false. I, I'm fine with that. But let's see if I say array equals not array, what happens then? <laughs> Who thinks that's false? Hands up. <laughs> Who thinks that's true? And that the other people are saying it's crashing or something. <laughs> Okay, this is actually true. <laughs> so I'm not just going to stand here and tell you JavaScript sucks as a language. There's actually a good reason why this is true. Let's drill into this. So every time um, you put a, I don't know what that sign means in English, Not a bang in front of something, um, it turns that something into a boolean, and you can see an array is false. So you're actually doing array equals false. And JavaScript is good at type conversions. So there's a rule in the double equals operator, which I just put you, for you on the slides then, that says every time something on the right side is a Boolean, you have to convert the left side into a number first. Okay, let's do that. 
So c converting an array into a number, that's going to be zero. So we're actually converting, comparing now zero equals false. And converting false into a number, that's zero. And this is why array equals not array. Great, isn't it? <laughs> we can do one better though. What is two equals array of two? Who says that's true? And who says that's false? And the other people are just here for, I don't know. <laughs> so that's actually true. <laughs> so what happened here? Hey, well, it's trying to do its best actually here. So it has to convert the right side into a number. I can simulate it this way. That's two. Why is it two? Yeah, well, you can simulate this by first converting the array into a string. So this is actually the string 2, and if I convert the string 2 into a number, well, you can guess that's the number 2, and this is why this is 2. And I can say, well, JavaScript seems to be really clever. It's grabbing out that value that they compare this. No, no, no. <laughs> so if you're trying to do something like plus 2, 3, it's actually not a number. Because what's happening here, if you convert this into a string, This is actually the string two comma three, and which is not going to be a number if you try to coerce it. So JavaScript is good at type conversion. Let's have some fun with this. So what is two plus one? So the string two plus the number one. So who says this is three? And who says this is 21, the string 21? Okay, you guys seem to know what I'm talking about. Okay, now let's get this right. What is this? <laughs> Anybody want to have a guess? Okay, no, no, one. Okay, who's saying this is not a number? And who's saying this is one? Okay, this is one. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> one time you just go ahead with a plus and convert it both to a string and just merge them. This is how templating works. And one time we just say, well, if it's a minus, we cannot do templating here, but so we're just going to go ahead and convert it into a number. Can we actually exploit this a little? Yeah, well, you can. What's this? <laughs> so. So if you actually do this in JavaScript, your teammates are going to hate you so much. <laughs> so who says this is three? And who says this is not a number? And who says this is a syntax error? No, this is three. This is how you do arithmetic in uh, JavaScript. No, you don't. So I said before, like everything is a number. So two actually has a number value. That's zero, and false has a uh, sorry, true has a value of one, and false has a value of zero. So you can actually do math with this. You can like do true plus true is two. <laughs> it makes it more right. <laughs> so JavaScript is pretty upfront about numbers, though. It actually has very cool features in there. Let me show you something. It actually has magically increasing numbers. <laughs> but that's actually not Brendan's fault here, that's just the number format he chose. Um, so this is actually, every number in JavaScript that's the only number format they have is IEEE 7.5, uh, 7.4, 7.5.4, sorry. And that's basically a long way of saying I can't do math. <laughs> so. There are a couple of things in there. So you can clearly see something is breaking here. It's not really, it's like a rounding error because the amount of stuff you can actually put into uh, before the exponent, it's just, those numbers just too big. So even if you like subtract one, it's still going over there. It's just a rounding error. You could be fine with it. Same thing happens if you use doubles in the Java. But there are a couple of things around this. So there's a function called parse int. You can pass it any string and it will give you back the int. Oh, doesn't it? What will this return? Okay, two. That works. 
So what will this return? You want to say not a number. Cool thing. I, I can live with this. Um, let's see what actually does with this number. So it's supposed to return an integer because it's called parse int, isn't it? So what is this going to return? It's actually just returning the offset number, which is definitely not an integer anymore. Great. So I actually got bitten by this once, because I was thinking parse int, that's obviously returning integers, so I don't have to do rounding here anymore, just flooring it or something. Yeah, that's cool. So I kind of figured I have to actually check what's coming back there. So um, one way to do this is to do, well, you want to see if it's not a number or something, so I was doing something like type of um, not a number, because I was putting in a string and I wanted to check, it, uh, check the input if it's actually valid. So what is type of not a number? It's, that's easy, that's just number. <laughs> And that's actually, again, not JavaScript's fault. This is how IEEE 754 actually works. Um, not a number is a special combination of bits in that whole 64 um, conglomerate of bits. And if everything is like one, uh, that's just not a number. Okay, not JavaScript's fault. Um, but because of having only IEEE 754 numbers, what's this going to be? Oh, you guys know about this, so that's obviously going to be false, just because um, you're always going to make like slightly rounding errors. <laughs> so we've all seen this before, like JavaScript has strings. Okay? Cool thing, we have strings. But what if we ask a string if it's instance of string? Is this true? No. Who says this is true? <laughs> <laughs> And who says this is false? You kind of undecide. Like, do you have like some third value I'm not aware of? <laughs> so this is actually false. What? This is clearly a string. What happened here? Yeah, well, if you're coming from Java, you're like expecting type checking with instance of, but that's not actually type checking. Instance of in JavaScript just looks for a constructor. If this object was constructed by a certain constructor function, so called with new name of the function, and this string was just a little, it, so it wasn't constructed by that string constructor. So if I actually want this to return true, I have to do new string instance of string, and that's true. And that's like the best thing for Java developers to actually just kill themselves all, because <laughs> That's like having a this keyword that just has different values each time you invoke the function. Sounds good to me. Um, in JavaScript, you can knock around with numbers, like doing three is bigger two, or doing two is bigger one, but what is three bigger two bigger one? Is that true? So who's saying that is false? Who's saying that is true? But that's actually false. Right? <laughs> what happened here? Well, pretty simple thing though. So as soon as you start comparing three, figure two, it actually builds up a boolean, and now it's comparing true is bigger than one, and you all know true is actually one, so it's comparing um, one bigger than one, so it doesn't make sense. So there's some people in Java's computer community that just like to fix it this way. <laughs> and there's some honors to other numbers as well. Let's say um, we could do something like one is smaller than number dot max value. And it's true. Oh. <laughs> I'm kind of relieved here. Let's see if that's actually true for minus one as well. And yeah, it works. Minus one is also smaller than number max value. But let's replace number max value with actual number min value. So we're going to say minus one is smaller than number min value. Who thinks that's true? <laughs> Who 
thinks that's false. So this is actually true. <laughs> so there's, there's some funny things around this. So number max value, that's just a really big number with a really big exponent. But number min value, that's just a really small number with a really small exponent, but it's still positive. I, th I could be fine with this, except this actually puts like a couple of things on other APIs that just hurt. So there's a function called math.max, and you could pass it any kind of uh, values, it just gives you back the maximum, and you actually there's a function called math.min, which does uh, the opposite. So and then you would expect to say math.min, uh, sorry, math.max should be bigger than math.min, because one is always like returning the bigger value, and the other one is always returning the smaller value. Who says that's true? <laughs> I kind of scared you there, didn't I? So who says that's false? And all the others, you just got it wrong all the time, you just don't want the boat anymore. <laughs> so this is actually false. So what happened here? Like, I think this one is really funny though. So math.max, because it has, every value you actually give to it has to be bigger to actually reduce itself, so it uses minus infinity because every number is going to be bigger, because math.min cannot actually use number min value to reduce itself, it has to use infinity. So this is why we're actually comparing minus infinity bigger than, kind of makes sense, doesn't it? But let's not kid ourselves, JavaScript is an honest language. So what would you say happens if you do math instance of math? It tells us how bad it is at math. So have a guess, what is this? Is this true or false? Who's saying this is true? I can tell you what it does. It crashes. <laughs> so, so let me actually explain why it crashes. So math is actually not a constructor function, it's actually just an object. So someone basically wrote something like math1 equals object that wrote. Then he actually patched some functions like math.max onto that object. Let me just simulate that here. So I'm just doing something like math.max or sorry, math.max equals function something something. And basically you could call it now like math.max. Okay? So but since this is not actually a function, it's an object, and instance of only works for function, this just crashes. So it's just the way of the, the implemented, but it's kind of funny. So I kind of left it in. Let's poke at a couple of ones before we actually get back to serious. What's the type of null? <laughs> Anybody? Nobody? Nobody? Yeah, of course, that's object. So easy checking there. But if you want to just do generative checking and say, well, null instance of object, what's this going to be? Of course, that's false. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> I convinced me completely. Well, let's get back to slides. So, let's actually focus on, GWT was very successful because it actually requ didn't require you guys to actually know about these quirks. We have a decent number type called integer, and it actually works like an integer. And we have clearly defined this. I wasn't dwelling so much about this, but in JavaScript, this is not defined by the object you're actually on. It's de 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 defined by the person that's invoking your function, so it could be set from the outside, which is kind of nice sometimes, but can actually have a lot of confusion going on. So GWT was so successful because it didn't actually hide the web platform from you guys but it made it better in terms of you didn't have to deal with the quirks and you could just write your code in a language that was sane and good to you. And think back in 2005, we had debugging as alert. We had completely different DOM APIs between different browsers. jQuery wasn't even invented, so that was completely different. When they did Google Maps, they basically had to write the application twice because the DOM was so different. And we, of course, completely different rendering. And GWT was one of the first applications that just lets you write stuff against one same API that just worked. 
But in 2014, most of the pain around the web platform, that has just been fixed. And if you just take a look at the Chrome DevTools, the amount of stuff you can now do with them, that's incredible. So, the web is clearly getting bigger every year. And Gwit was successful because it, was, it removed the bad parts while keeping the good stuff. And there's actually a new sweet spot for Gwit. And think about it, people are telling us and other people a lot that all the cool kids are now doing JavaScript. And I think that's just a perception thing. I think overall, the Java community is big and can support itself very, very good. So just because other people are doing JavaScript, that's not a reason to switch. If you like JavaScript and if you feel productive in it, that's maybe a reason to switch, but not what the other people are doing. The JavaScript ecosystem is just growing. There's lots more interesting stuff there. This is why we're introducing the JS interop stuff to be able to leverage that ecosystem as well as we leverage the Java ecosystem. And this new JS interop will actually yield a new sweet spot for Gwen. This is the only way to use all the tools from the Java world and the JavaScript world. And actually, JavaScript has a sweet spot for compilers as well, because JavaScript serves two masters. People writing by hand and people compiling to it. And the number of people compiling to it is not getting less people, it's getting way more people. And eventually, the people actually compiling to it are going to win. And that's not just my personal belief, it's actually what Brendan Eich believes, and a lot of other people as well that work on this. And he actually said JavaScript might go away someday because it just becomes the bytecode and the source language is never written by hand. Because even with error function, it's just too verbose. I could believe that future, but that will take a while to get to. And in the meantime, people are handwriting and compiling to it. So by using GWT, you're not isolating yourself from a new hip system. You're actually doing something that's pretty smart. Because JavaScript, in a way, is just the bytecode of the web. And Douglas Crockford actually put this pretty nice. We had always thought that the Java, the JVM, would be the VM of the web. But it turns out that's just JavaScript. Because the JavaScript parser does a far more efficient job of providing code security than the JVM's bytecode verifier. JavaScript did a better job of keeping the right ones run everywhere, promise. Perhaps because it works at a higher level, avoiding low-level edge cases. And then Turing just takes care of the rest. And this is why GWT has such a sweet spot. Because you can write in Java in that <coughs> same language with all those tools around, with these big, huge libraries, with this community of everything. And then you can run anywhere. And running anywhere means running on top of the JDM, but it also means running on top of a JavaScript VM. Thank you. <laughs>
And I don't know if you see the Unreal demo that Mozilla published together with ASM.js. That was incredible. So this means now that EMScript closes this loop for all the C and C++ developers. And they can't get to wait on the web because this means they can reach anybody with their games. Let's not kid ourselves. The web is the biggest platform out there by a far margin than anybody, anything else. So this pressure just from the C, C++ people will make it so much better for compilers. They were even discussing having a go-to statement in ECMAScript 6 just because it's way better for compilers. It's not actually going to be there because there's some idiomatic JavaScript people which think that's like the devil putting it into the language. But just the discussion shows that there will be support for people compiling. And I think that's really great. So we're not on some abandoned code path where you have to migrate off. We're actually on a pretty good code path. I'm not saying here, to be, just to be clear, it's bad to write JavaScript. I'm just saying it's not com bad either to compile to it. Any questions? <laughs> Are you going to uh, support Dart uh, instead of uh, JavaScript in future? So, um, we have, we've heard that uh, Git will uh, support Dart in future, maybe in two or three years. Later. So, yeah, we discussed this at the panel. This question came up. And so, right now, how would we actually support Dart? Um, because right now, there is no Dart VM in Chrome. So, well, we want to let you run your web application in a browser. So as soon as there's actually a Dart VM in the browser and this Dart VM turns out to be significantly faster than V8, we can certainly think about building a GWT to Dart compiler. So why not? If, if the Dart VM is faster and you guys want to have like, I don't know, 2x faster applications to do something, that's a good way of doing this. But right now, uh, that's not something we have planned because it's just not there yet. Is that a good answer? Questions? Okay, then, um, so the problem for me is I'm standing now between you and beer, and as Brandon said, that's never a good place to be. Um, so I think there's beer outside, so have some fun.